Some Indians were resistant to the Spanish and anyone else who invaded their land. However, over time, the Indians returned from Mexico to the area in a different manner. Indian culture in uh, Mexico has evolved over time. And it's, uh, it's not that it has disappeared as much as it has changed. There's a famous story, famous in San Antonio at least, that when the King of Spain came to visit San Antonio, he was being shown around San Jose Mission. The King of Spain turned to the mayor of uh, San Antonio, who was his tour guide on this uh, visit. It was Henry Cisneros at the time. And he, he said, well, Mayor, what happened to the Indians? Where did they go? And Henry looked at him and said, Your Majesty, we are the Indians. As time went by, the Spanish soldiers and the Indians intermarried. And uh, consequently, a lot of the people in living in Mexico and on this side of the river, the Mexican-Americans on this side, are descendants of those unions, which was very interesting, of course. But uh, the Spanish effect uh, is long-lasting. Most of the names in this area are Spanish names. Presidio uh, del Norte, for example, where El Paso is, Cibolo, the name of this location, which is the Spanish word for buffalo, but almost all of the names in the area are derived from the Spanish. There are a few Indian words. There is a mountain range that borders this particular ranch called uh, Shanati, and that is an Indian word meaning blackbird. But we do have a sprinkling of Indian words that are left. The Texas Indians uh, in historic times were primarily nomadic. Uh, Comanches, the, the dominant tribe, Comanches never formed a permanent settlement, never in their whole history. They uh, uh, lived in tents, teepees. They hunted the buffalo. When they, uh, an area read low on game or got too polluted, uh, it is an utter myth that the Indian was environmentally conscientious. I mean, they buff slaughtered buffalo and just left the rays around. But when an area got too uh, polluted, they would simply pick up and leave. And in the vastness of this land, it is so enormous uh, that uh, uh, human beings in the Indian times were just specks on the horizon. There were only a few thousand of them comparatively. And uh, their attitude uh, is, uh, was, was not to the land as such. I think the Indian was more attuned to the spirit world to the magic of a different culture. There's been a dearth of prehistoric speculation about this particular area. The early Indian history throughout Texas is sparsely documented, but uh, the earliest uh, recorded uh, history of the Indian life in this area was around the, oh, the late 17th and early 18th centuries. This particular area was inhabited, there was a village called the Cibolo village, which was inhabited by the Cibolo Indians, which was right, not on this immediate spot of the Cibolo fort, but it was at the head of the spring, the waters that feed this area. The Cibolo Indians were very peaceful agricultural Indians, and they probably farmed this particular valley and they had a lot of water that came from the spring. That uh, was recorded by a Spanish uh, lieutenant who came through here with an, a Spanish entrada uh, that was going through the country exploring. And the young lieutenant recorded the presence of the Cibolo Indians. They were later dispersed by the Apache Indians who roamed through this country and they were the enemies of all of the more peaceful Indians who were primarily agricultural. And so the Cibolo Indians then deserted their village in this immediate area and fled to the Rio Grande, which is down uh, south of here about 19 miles. Uh, one of the books that I've uh, translated from uh, Spanish uh, 
uh, military records is uh, is of a Spanish expedition to this area in uh, 1747. Uh, it was uh, 150 men uh, expedition to the to uh, the junction of the rivers, and they were looking for uh, places to set uh, up a fort, a presidio, um, at the end of the um, uh, 18th at the middle of the 18th century. Uh, so they visited uh, areas up and down the river, but they also visited um, the uh, big springs that are now, uh, that were part of the Favor Ranch, the Milton Favor Ranch, that are now owned by um, uh, Mr. Point Dexter, uh, and it is at the site of the Cibolo Fort. Uh, so uh, we have a description of the Spanish uh, expedition visiting that area. Uh, being guided by the Cibolo Indians at that time, who were who were part of the Humano Indian groups. The uh, Spanish never put a lot of people in Texas. They were unable to. It would still be uh, totally Hispanic if they had been able to do that, as in Mexico. Uh, it was a rough frontier. The American Indians uh, made it very difficult for the Spanish to uh, settle. The springs of uh, the Cibolo were really the reason that the ranch is located where it is. There, there was a mission in this area that was established in the 1700s because this was an Indian settlement up here. The tribe was called the Humanos. When Milton Favor wanted to establish his headquarters, he needed a place that had a reliable, consistent source of water, and this is it. This water flows year-round. It's a good, strong flow. It's very reliable. And it's the reason that, that uh, the ranch is here. It's beautiful water. It comes from the aquifer up in the, up in the mountains there. The only reason for the existence of the ranch, the only reason for the existence of any history in the area, is the uh, great springs of the Cibolo, El Ojo Grande del Cibolo. And the great springs are prolific. They are the largest source of water in the area. They run thousands of gallons of water, very pure water, per minute. When the property was acquired, the springs were partially clogged and were basically a swamp uh, surrounding uh, the uh, point where the springs issue from the ground. Oddly, most people think springs are a granite cliff with a, a brass Budweiser tap driven into the cliff face and where you just turn it on and pure water flows out. But what a spring really is, is just a mud hole, just where the water comes out of the ground. And they have to, the springs have to be channeled into an acequia or an irrigation channel and then converted to a productive use. If the springs were downhill, not uphill from fertile land, they would have been useless. If there was no way to convey the water by gravity because of cliffs or some other problem, uh, from the site of the springs to the fields, there could have been no agriculture. The ranch in uh, Favor's time really spread across three different springs. And each of those springs has a different topographic character to it. Right around uh, Cibolo is the largest of the springs. It has a very steady flow and the land is uh, very flat, so it's easy to farm, and it could be irrigated from, from the, the uh, spring. So Milton Favor, when he arrived in uh, the 1850s, made that basically the agricultural part of, of his ranching enterprise. We call it the desert blood. It's what keeps everything alive out here, water. And it's, it's the lifeline of the desert. This particular ranch has about 12, major springs on it, which feeds it all over. And there's 30,000 acres here. And it is this essential, since every one of the forts was built around a major spring, Cibolo, Cienica, and La Marita. Milton Favor built a successful business in Mexico. He had married, had a son, but when he heard about three springs in Texas, he headed north to build a ranch around the water. He brought a herd of Mexican cattle, establishing cattle ranching for the first time in West Texas. 
Milton Favor not only introduced cattle ranching to the area, his herd numbered 20,000. Ambitious, driven, Favor planned well his future empire. His forts would expand to three, Cibolo, La Cienega, and La Morita. Cibolo was his farming operation. His cattle were quartered at La Cienega. His sheep and goats at La Morita. First fort he built was Fort Cibolo, El Fortín del Cibolo, which is this location. But uh, he had to protect himself because he had usurped the springs, the Cibolo Springs, and that was Indian domain. Despite the rigors of life, Favor and his family prospered. He and his wife and their son Juan were able to enjoy a comfortable life and even traveled, importing fine furniture from France and other parts of Europe. Here's an individual who lived on the roughest of frontiers, who held out against the Apaches and the Comanches for seven years, from 1861 to 1867, while there were no Confederate or federal troops in the area, and who uh, fought border ruffians nearly every week of his life, presumably, who resisted uh, Indian attacks and had to make a life for himself, and had to make a life for uh, hundreds of retainers uh, in the local area, and he was about five feet tall. He was a very short, small man who projected authority by force of personality rather than by his physical presence. The rumors of Favor's past only added to his authority. Oh, well, Milton Favor is somewhat of a uh, Big Ben mystery man because he uh, apparently came here from Missouri, and act not to here exactly, but he went, he went to Chihuahua first. Uh, the history on him says that he believed he had killed a man in some sort of an incident in Missouri and fled for fear of prosecution. Frances Harper knows well the favor legends. She grew up at La Cienega and continues today to live in the Big Bend. John Poole, her grandfather, bought La Cienega from Milton Favor. The two men had known each other in Missouri. Poole brought good news when he met Favor again in Texas. Grandfather came to this country. He, uh, and some years later, met Milton Favor, and they were so glad to see one another. In the meantime, Milton Favor had uh, married and had a, a place, had bought some land, or had acquired some land. And in the course of conversation, my grandfather told him that he was not a wanted man, that the man had not died, and uh, that he could go on and live a normal life. And Ted came to this country, and we did our I lived there when we did our court and we did it horseback. He'd come right over from his ranch to our place horseback. The first time I came over there, uh, we had moved into the Cutter Sile Ranch, which was about 14 miles uh, northeast of there on the other side of the Sienega Mountain. Uh, my dad had met Mr. Greenwood and had uh, gotten directions as to how the trails went to go over there. So one Sunday afternoon, Dad said, well, why don't we run over, drive on over to the Sienega and see the, the Greenwoods and get acquainted. So we rode over there and we, as we rode up to the ranch, I thought that's the most beautiful place I'd ever seen, big cottonwood trees. And they had a real nice grassy place right out in front of the old fort there. And they, Frances and her mother and daddy were sitting out there in the shade when we rode up horseback. And uh, they were fixing to leave to take her to town to, to school. It was on a Friday evening. And we only visited about 30 minutes, just got acquainted. And she wasn't dressed up very pretty, I but. I never leave. <laughs> 
But uh, uh, all the way back to the ranch, which is 14 miles horseback, I sure did a lot of thinking. And I thought, I'm, I think I'll write that little girl a letter and see if I can't get a date with her. Well, when he came over horseback that first time, he had on his boots and shaps and hat. When he got to Marfa, he came in a brand new car that they had just bought that, and moved to this country, and we were all pretty poor then, so that car was very impressive. And he had on a gray suit and a little snap brand hat and some gray shoes. And he said, I came to see your sister. I said, I don't know who you are, but I'm not, <laughs> I don't have a sister. <laughs> yeah, she looked a little different too when, I, when she walked to the door than I'd seen her at the ranch. <laughs> Worked out all right though. Life at Cienega left Francis with good memories even though it was a solitary life for the family. We didn't have television, we didn't have lights, and uh, actually, uh, I can re remember that from the time I was four years old, I, I rode horseback, and, and uh, uh, mother rode, we, that's, that's the way we entertained ourselves, was riding. And uh, she would carry my brother. He was just uh, 18 months old. She would carry him in front of her and ride and check the cattle and check on things then. And, and uh, we looked forward to going to town. My grandmother lived in Shafter, and we would go to Shafter. And, on occasion, most of, and in fact, I went to school in Shafter. I rode from Sienega to Shafter horseback school when I was seven years old. When Frances and her brother played outside, they created their own entertainment. Play. We didn't have toys to play with that scattered all over the house like they have now. I had my horse. And I had uh, a pet burro, and there were just the two of us. There's a bank over there at the Cienega that has a, a clay base to it, and we would get that clay and make horses and cows and corrals. I never was a very good artist, but I could make a wave of a good corral for them. <laughs> The inside of Francis's home was comfortable and even formal. Family photos and artifacts that were a part of her life are placed around the restored home. Milton Favor ruled the open range with his La Cienega cattle empire. Cienega means marshy place or perhaps swamp. And indeed, that is what it is. There's a prolific uh, spring, irrigates a large area, that he channeled again into a series of acequias, and he used La Cienega as his cattle headquarters, using the famous F brand at La Cienega. With almost no forest to use for wooden fences, Favor built extensive rock walls on the property to contain his cattle. The walls of the fort were also constructed to enclose his valuable stock during Indian attacks. It amazes me the intelligence that some of those people had because it, that fort was built so that the Indians from on the hill could not shoot into it. 